Our computers and our digital devices are as mainstream as any other appliance we have in our homes. We depend on them just as we depend on our dishwasher, our microwave ovens, and our washing machines. Each year, we become more and more dependent on these devices. And these devices have enhanced our lives in many ways, the many advances it has given us. For me, I have no sense of direction, so the GPS is really a wonderful advancement in my life. For you, maybe you get to work at home because you can bring your devices at home and you get to spend more time with your family. Some people enjoy connecting with their family and friends all over the place. There are many, many positives to technology. However, there are many pitfalls and negatives to technology, and the time is now to really evaluate technology's place in our life before we lose the things that we value most, human emotional connection. Before technology, we would gather around a table and we would converse and share stories and share memories and maybe even argue, but we were connecting emotionally. Today, we go to a restaurant or even in our home and these devices are apparent. We see an entire table of families or friends gathered around looking down at their devices. There is a time and a place for technology, but it isn't everywhere. Human connection is important. We're here to support each other. We're here because we all are part of something bigger. And when we disconnect and allow our devices to continue to do this at a rate, we are losing something very valuable. When we think about positive reform, it is possible. I'm here to tell you that it is quite possible. As an educator and a parent, I have spent the last four years educating students from second grade all the way through college and talked to them about their social media use, about technology in, the life, in their lives, whether it's the positives and the negatives. We need to address the positives, and our children desperately need our help. We are the first generation of parents raising children in the technological era. We ill-prepared them for what was ahead. Not because we didn't care, we didn't know. Technology has been in our life for 20 plus years now. We now know. We now know that our devices can't be everywhere. We now know that there is a time and a place for it. We need to start with guidelines and strategies. Each time I go to a school and speak to students, there is a line of students waiting to talk to me, begging me for information. What do I do if someone sends me a picture that's inappropriate? If I'm on Snapchat and my mother says no, what do I do? They need our help. The time is now for positive reform, and we need to start with the screen itself. The screen is an emotional disconnect. Part of life is getting our feelings hurt. That is a reality. When we were younger, people would say mean things to us, and we might would say them back. But the problem is we, as human beings, use body language to guide us. Our children don't have that. If someone said something mean to me, or I said something mean to someone and when I was younger, I saw a tilt of a head, a shrug of a shoulder, and I got a knot in my stomach. I had a natural consequence to what I was doing, that my words had power. That gut, that intuition was teaching me something. It doesn't feel good to hurt someone. The problem is the screen went up and our children's empathetic skills went way down. It is a generation of children who need to strengthen their empathetic skills because everything we've taught them offline, be kind, be respectful, think about what you're saying before you act, all of those things, for some reason, they are not transferring once they get behind that keyboard. This is where we need to start. We need to teach them when they give it, we give them a device. You see this screen? This is an emotional disconnect. There are real people on the other side of that screen who have very big contact lists, who have many friends and followers. So imagine something publicly embarrassing said about you. And everyone in this new room knew about it because your 200 friends posted it, your 300 friends posted it. This is what our children are dealing with. And now they're going into their school knowing their whole entire school knows something publicly embarrassing about them. 
I'm a grown woman with a halfway decent self-esteem. That would be hard for me. These are kids trying to find their way. Technology is making it very hard for them. It's like a minefield. We need to teach them about the emotional disconnect. We need to teach them to think. Every time you put something out there, you need to say, how would this make me feel? That's going to strengthen their empathetic skills. We need to teach them that it's not okay that you post whatever you want without any regard. We need to teach them that it's not okay to take a picture or video of someone without their permission and post it. We also need to teach them about anonymous sites. Kids go down and play Xbox, their friends aren't available, and they play with anyone, complete strangers. In our day, we always got the note that there was someone in our neighborhood. I don't know why it was always a white van, but it was always a white van. Now that's not the problem. They're in our homes, on our computers. It is dangerous. Our children, I'm talking from second grade all the way up, think it is normal and appropriate to talk to strangers online. We all read the newspaper. Children have been murdered. Children have been sexually abused. Many things have happened because they think it's normal to engage in conversations with people they don't know. It's not okay. And we need to get that really, really strong in their heads. That's a social norm. So not only do we need to give them guidelines and strategies and rules, we also need to give them tools. And the tools we give them are, you, you might be hearing a lot about this word mindfulness. I am 100% behind this mindfulness movement. Again, we socialized in our streets and face to face. And by doing that, we learned many, many wonderful coping skills. Wonderful. We learned resilience. We knew, learned how to stick up for ourselves. We learned that our feelings got hurt and we bounced back. Our children did not grow up this way. Our children grew up very structured. So they don't have the coping skills we have. And we need to give them to them. So imagine a time when you use your computer all the time. You're playing with your friends and something's buzzing in your pocket. It's constant distraction. It's constant multitasking. As an educator, I learned that multitasking was not good. Nowhere did I learn it was good. Give kids a lot of things and it will help them pay attention. It doesn't work. What I learned was the number one predictor of success is someone's ability to focus and follow through. And our children are distracted constantly. Even when they have friends at their, at their house, they're sitting right next to each other with their devices. So we need what mindfulness is to overly give you an oversimplification of what mindfulness is. It's the ability to be in the present moment fully with your mind and all of your senses. So now you're all listening to me, you're engaged, you're mindfully listening to what I'm saying. If your mind's wandering and you're saying, right after this, I have to go to CVS, I have to make that doctor appointment, my kid's, my kid's game is at this time, your mind is wandering. You're not mindfully engaged. Well, we can train you to do that. We can give you that skill so our children aren't the table of kids with their devices. So our children go to parties and enjoy the event for what it is. We've all gone to parties. I've gone to graduation parties with teens where a three to four hour party, no one is engaging with each other. They're selfie, 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 post a post, let me video it, and let me post it. Wait, I don't like that, let me do it again. Three hours go by, that's an anti-mindful behavior. I want my children to be there and engage. And guess what, the party is not about you. The party is about someone else. And learning to be happy for someone else and celebrating someone else's milestones is a good thing. So our children are learning to be narcissistic, voyeuristic, that multitasking is good, that um, overvaluing their peers' feedback to such an unhealthy level because of that like button, that they make decisions based on everyone else's approval. Now that's normal for an, a teen, but not to this level. Not to this level that they do everything for a like. It's peer pressure in their pocket. We can do better. We have to give them the tools. And mindfulness is a wonderful, I started my mindfulness practice about four years ago, and I can tell you it is a fulfilling life. 
when you learn to be present and engaged in here and now, it's fulfilling. And our children, I'm afraid, are being fulfilled with artificial things. They look at people's posts and they compare their lives to someone's fabulous day. No one's posting all the bad things. No one's saying, oh, my parents might get divorced or, or um, I just failed my geometry test. Or they're all posting the really great things and really putting a false sense of themselves up there. That's not healthy. Socially and emotionally, this is getting in the way of our children's development. And we need to act now. We know what it's good for. It's great that you can look up your research paper at no problem. It's not okay that people walk down the street like this and everybody should part away like it's the Red Sea. There's just a news story that someone was walking into an elevator on their phone and there was a sign they were uh, repairing the elevator and they walked in. It was only two feet and they were fine. But this is what's happening. And we all laugh because like, oh, that's funny, that's funny. I know the other side. I have good relationships. I connect with people. I know how to do that because of my life experience. What kind of marriages are they going to have? What kind of friendships are they going to have when you can't connect emotionally with each other? We have to find its place. I'm not saying technology is bad, but we really need to give them the skills they, they need to build a healthier way of living and find its place. The technology companies have a place in this as well. We have Apple, um, Google, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, all of them. They're all giving our devices. Wouldn't it be nice if we walked into an Apple store and the first question they asked us was, oh, how old is the person you're buying this device for? Oh, they're 12. Oh, we offer these courses for the parents to learn how to set the settings and blocks that's age appropriate. And we also offer a course for the children to Beware of the pitfalls and use it with good intent. That, that would be great. They have a responsibility. We all have a responsibility in making some positive reform. Parents, schools, and the tech companies. We all can do this if we just any little time you see someone doing it in an inappropriate way, make awareness. The other day I was just grocery shopping and I was packing my, my food and the the teen, I'm getting guess he was like 19 or 20. He was ringing the register, and all of a sudden there was so much food, and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going so fast. And I'm looking, and he is scrolling through social media while I'm doing his job. We can do better. So I, of course, politely said, um, I'm sorry, but you know, this is your job. You really shouldn't be on your phone while you're working. That's a poor work ethic. These are things that are going to be affected if we don't take a look. It's important, and we want the best for our children. We have to teach them what applies offline applies online. Be kind. We all have a responsibility, and I ask each of you to please take a look at what you're modeling, take a look at how you can find a better balance, and be part of the solution of the misuse of social media by giving guidelines and strategies, by giving them tools, and being an advocate for your children because schools are trying to figure this out too. Some schools I go to, it's bring your own technology. That's, their, that's what they, their policy is. Some schools give them iPads or school iPads. Find out, be active, be engaged, and find, oh, can my kid download games? Because that's what happened with my own child. I didn't know. The only way they didn't, I knew this, is because they had my Apple ID so they could, they could download it. But these are the conversations we have. We can't put our hands up and say, well, I don't know how to work technology. Well, I don't know how to work. Believe me, I am not computer savvy. That's the joke of all of this. But I have to give my children guidelines and strategies. I do have to care about a society of what we're promoting and what, we're, what the outcome of this is gonna be. Because what I'm talking about today in a very short amount of time is just scratching the surface of what technology is bringing if we don't bring awareness and mindfully think, okay, where is it good, where is it not? So I ask each of you to please be part of the solution and help however you can. Thank you.